Hi, thanks for uh, joining us for this CAM APS FX app training. The idea of this um, training is that it's a resource that can be used after you've completed the online CAM APS FX training. Um, in potentially it can be used in conjunction with your healthcare team um, with the recording being stopped and started as needs be during the process of setting the app up and linking the devices. So just as a reminder, of what the system consists of. So the CAM APS FX app is um, an app that's housed on an Android smartphone. We often get lots of questions about which start, smart, type of smartphones are best to use. So anything that is um, found on the Dexcom compatibility list. So we want a Dexcom G6 compatible Android smartphone. And if you Google Dexcom G6 compatibility, um, uh, there's a there's a um, compatibility tool that you can pop in the type of phone you've got and it tells you um, which is compatible with the Dexcom G6. So obviously the system links with the Dexcom G6 uh, transmitter and sensor which provides the glucose data and the system also links by Bluetooth with um, a Dana insulin pump either the Dana RS or the Dana I and the, de the system sends data to the cloud so there's no need to upload um, as long as you have a SIM card or you're attached to the Wi-Fi, then data will automatically be sent to Diasend. So there's a few things you need to do, first of all, to prepare the pump um, so that it's ready to use with the auto mode feature. So the first thing that is really important is because the way this closed loop system works is by switching off the pre-programmed pump basal and um, instead replacing it with um, a very short 10 minute extended bolus um, every 10 minutes, depending on um, the fluctuation in glucose level. Um, one of the really important things is making sure the extended bolus function is switched on. And you can see there how to find that. So you would just go into the main menu, choose the bolus menu, and then in the sub menu, go to bolus settings. And then it's number two, which is just below um, the way you change your carb ratio. So you'd go in there and make sure it's switched on and then go to the bottom and save those settings. The other thing that's important is to go into the hidden doctor's mode menu and put some of the parameters in there that mean closed loop can work effectively. So to get into the doctor's mode menu, you need to hold down the plus and the arrow button and whilst holding them down, press the minus button and then it asks for a password. And the password that you put in um, is generated depending on the shipping date that's in the in the pump shipping information. So you'd need to first of all go into the review menu of the um, of the pump uh, and find the shipping date. Um, and then the password is always um, three zero and then the day of shipping. So if the day of shipping was the 12th of the 6th, 2020, then the password would be 3012. When you get into the doctor's mode setting, there's um, some settings that are, um, will affect the functioning of the cl of closed loop auto mode. So one of the main ones we need to do is make sure the bolus increment, which is number four, is set to 0 0.05. Um, just a note about decreasing ratio. People are usually more familiar with active insulin time. Um, so active insulin in this situation means how much active insulin is currently in the pump. So if it's a new pump or it hasn't been used recently, then it will say zero in terms of current active insulin. But decreasing ratio is what we consider the active insulin time. So if it's a four hour active insulin time, the decreasing ratio is 25%. If it was a three hour, we'd put it on 30%. If it's two hour active insulin time, 50%. Then in terms of the um, mac, basal max, we need to pop it as the um, highest, uh, double the highest hourly basal. And that's the same as you would in normal pump therapy in case you wanted to run a 200% increased temporary basal. So if the highest basal is 0.5 units an hour, then you'd want to pop that on 1.0 units an hour. Then bolus max and daily max, we need to set them high enough to allow auto mode to function in the way it's designed to. So for the vote, but bolus max we need to put it as half the total daily dose so if you had someone with a total daily dose of 30 then you'd put the bolus max on 15 and then the daily max needs to be three times the total daily dose again just to give the system um, enough leeway to develop deliverance and effectively in closed loop so in that situation uh, with a total daily dose of 30 you'd put the daily max on 90 
and then you'd need to go down to exit and press OK to save those settings. In order to download the app onto the Amazon, uh, onto the um, Android smartphone uh, itself, you need to use the Amazon App Store. Um, again, there's some confusion. Sometimes people think that they can get it from Google Play. They can't. The app is only available from the Amazon App Store. So there's a link there of, of how you um, that you can go to to download the Amazon App Store. Um, once you've downloaded the Amazon App Store, you can search for the Cam APSFX app in there, and then that will come up as you can see there. Sometimes um, you'll also show another app that we have, which is the Cam APS HX. So make sure you are downloading the correct FX app, and um, and then install it as you would any other app on a phone. Once you've installed, um, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to create an account. So it's a, lots of messages will pop up asking you to allow Cam APSFX to access contacts and um, allow battery saving and certain other things. Anything that it asks you to allow, allow. Um, then you need to go to sign up if you're a new user. Um, and when you sign up, you will need to create yourself a password that has to be 12 characters and it has to contain a capital letter, a lowercase letter, a number and a symbol to um, be secure enough. So you might want to have a think about that um, before you get to that stage. And then once you've signed up, you'll have a welcome page and then you'll be able to press start. And really the app takes you through um, the stages really nicely. So the first thing that we have to do once we've signed in is pair the app to the Dana insulin pump. So um, before you pair the pump, it's really important if you've been using the pump with an any Dana app um, that you want to um, unpair that from the phone that it was paired to, like delete the any Dana app and unpair the um, pump from the Bluetooth settings of the phone that it was used before and delete that app from the phone. Then you can go ahead and choose the type of Dana pump that you've got just by touching the little dot by the relevant pump and then press continue. You'll get a message that says essentially you need to know how to use this pump. So if you haven't been trained on how to use the pump, then you need to talk to your healthcare team so that that training can be um, organized for you. Then once you've chosen the type of pump um, that you're linking to, the um, phone will scan for that pump and, and, and a, a list of pumps that are available to pair will come up. And usually if uh, um, you've usually only got one pump that you can use, so um, that just that pump will come up. And if you want to check the serial number, it is written on the side of the pump as well as in the shipping information in the review menu of the pump. So you touch the little dot by the pump serial number and then press continue. And then the next step that the system wants is it wants the training code or a training code to, to allow access to the system. So the training code can either be provided by um, uh, your um, a member of your team who's had their training, or if you've completed the online training, you will have generated yourself um, a certificate. And on that certificate is um, a, a trainer number. So you can um, put that you, you have self-trained by entering that number there. But either way, you have to have a training number to be able to use the system. Um, and you press continue. And once you've linked um, to the um, pump, it will ask you to pair to a Dexcom transmitter. And you'll make a note of the transmitter serial number at this point, uh, especially if you've been using it connected to um, the Dexcom G6 app before you link to the Cam APS FX app. So if you have been using it with another phone, you'll make a note of that transmitter serial number. You'll delete the Dexcom app from that phone and you'll unpair the Dexcom G6 transmitter from the um, Bluetooth menu on your phone. So it's not connected to anything. A Dexcom transmitter can only be connected via one mobile channel at a time. So if you have been using it in conjunction with another device, you will need to unpair from that device first of all before you can repair to a new device and then you'll select um, that it's that you're using a Dexcom G6 again you'll get a warning saying you need to know how to use a Dexcom G6 and then you'll enter that transmitter ID that always starts with an 8 and confirm it then once you've confirmed it it will ask you to um, enter the your body weight uh, to the nearest whole kilo and confirm that and then it will ask you to enter the total daily insulin dose 
to the nearest whole unit. And it's really important that this is calculated accurately um, from all bolus and all basal insulin used in the, uh, in the past five to seven days prior to transitioning onto the app. To start off with, the, all the system knows about the person that is using it is their weight and their total daily dose and everything else it learns as it goes along. So it's important that those two um, figures are as accurate as possible before you start. So once you've popped your total daily dose in there and pressed confirm, it will give you the notice that it's now connecting to the transmitter. It will also say if it's the first time you've used this transmitter, make sure you insert and attach your transmitter in order to pair. Um, if you already had a transmitter up and running with another, um, with the Dexcom G6 app, G6 app on a phone or on a receiver, then um, the glucose level will um, just start to read as soon as the transmitter is paired. If it's the new sensor that you're inserting, at this stage it will ask you to start warm up and it will ask for that five digit code on the back of the peel off strip of the sensor that means that it's factory calibrated. And then you'll see the glucose readings appear there. At this stage, you can turn auto mode on. So it's as simple as literally toggling across the button at the bottom right and confirming that you indeed want to turn auto mode on. It does give you a message that active insulin reported by the pump may be incorrect for the first few hours um, after auto mode starts. Um, and it asks you, it reminds you not to use Bolus Wizard on the pump from this stage, everything um, will be done via the app. So you'll, you'll do uh, your Bolus via the app. And with all these messages, you can either say, I don't ever want to see this message again by touching the box at the bottom left um, and that message won't appear again, or you can just press the cross at the top right to get the message to disappear just in this instance. Once you switch auto mode across the system, um, goes from a, a black surround screen to an orange surround screen. And the orange screen is when it's in starting or attempting mode. And you'll see um, little eye, the little round circle buzzing in the bottom right hand corner while the app is pulling all the relevant data from the sensor and the pump in order to be able to start auto mode. And once auto mode is started, you'll see that the surround of the, the home screen goes to green. And certainly you should expect to see the app in green for the majority of the time. Certainly on all the um, studies that we've done, people manage to stay in auto mode 95, 96% of the time. So just a reminder about how the algorithm learns. So it takes all the CGM data and the insulin bolus and meal data from the pump and the CGM, and it learns about the individual's insulin sensitivity and it predicts future glucose levels in order to optimize um, insulin infusion and optimise glycemic control. So it continually adjusts the basal based on previous learning. And it's just worth mentioning that it takes about two to three weeks to fully optimise and it learns more when boost and ease off aren't on. So boost and ease off are meant to be used as sort of occasional features to help um, if you've gone a bit high or you're having, um, you, you're in a situation from say an exercise point of view where you want the system to just back off a little bit. We'll talk more about that coming up, but it learns um, more without, without those systems uh, functions running. So it's just worth bearing that in mind, especially in the first couple of weeks while you're, um, the system's gathering lots of information. This just shows you everything that's on the home screen. So in the, it's home screen, the little house on the top left um, with the line under depicts that you're on the home screen. So first of all, at the top right of the white part of the screen, there's a little eye information icon. And if you touch that, it gives you various pieces of information that you might want to know at certain points in time, like how much battery is left in the pump and how much active insulin there is currently available, um, how much insulin used so far today, that sort of thing. The sensor glucose trend and the actual glucose number is exactly the same display as you would see on Dexcom G6. Essentially, the Dexcom G6 app is embedded within the CAM APSFX app. So all those same displays, alerts, alarms, um, notifications that you're used to if you've been using Dexcom G6 previously will be exactly the same. There's a little um, screen rotation icon there that just reminds you that you can turn the, the screen, the phone on its side and view um, the data on closed loop delivery in the landscape view, which gives you lots more information. There's the, um, the glucose range axis and the gray band is the, the, 
range indicator, the target range indicator there, so you'll see. You can pinch that axis or pull that axis on the on the right hand side there so that you see that grey band in like a, a visually wider band um, if that's how you want to look at it. You can also scroll back 24 hours on this front home screen to see what the glucose has been doing. We talked a bit just now about ease off and boost buttons and this is where they are and we'll go through those in more detail. We've already talked about where you switch auto mode off and on and the fact that the status, auto mode status is on and the surround is in green. And then you'll also be familiar with the glucose sensor profile, which the dots will go um, black. Uh, there'll be filled in dots when you're in target range. And if you're above target range, the dots will be open and appear white. You can also see this person has a personal glucose target set. So the, the app itself is um, set to default to a 5.8 millimole per litre glucose target. But if you make an adjustment to that, then it shows you there's a target comes up on the screen there to remind you that you've got a, a different target active. One of the really important things to remember um, with closed loop therapy is that it's it can be quite dangerous to bolus late. The reason being is because the system will have started to ramp up insulin delivery in response to the meal being eaten. So the glucose, so someone's eaten a meal at this point, the glucose has really started to rise because no insulin was delivered. The system's ramped up its insulin delivery in order to try and bring down that rise. The bolus is then delivered late after the system's done quite a lot of work. It can back off to nothing, but essentially at that point, it's like having had a double bolus really, and the upshot of that can be um, uh, an episode of hypoglycemia later on. So it's really important um, to either bolus, ideally 10 to 15 mil minutes before you eat um, a carbohydrate containing meal, or else um, if you uh, were on the lower side, say you know you're five and you've got down arrows you might need you might leave it slightly closer to the time of actually eating but try to avoid delivering insulin boluses late after eating where, where possible so the thing that you'll be doing most with the app is going into the bolus calculator to give your pre-meal bolus so the bolus calculator is the little knife and fork icon at the top of that home screen and when you press it it pulls information off the pump um, and so it kind of whirs for a couple of seconds before linking and then it brings you to this page. So what you would need to do, you'll see the glucose level automatically pulls through from the sensor glucose data and it is in grey and the reason it's in grey is because even if it was above or below target the system would have been adjusting in the previous um, period of time before bolusing to make the adjustment to the glucose level as needed so there's nothing that needs to happen on top of that. So generally, all you would need to do is enter your carbs. So you can either preset one of these um, uh, meal size boluses here. But the most accurate way to do this and carb counting, um, accurate carb counting is really crucial with hybrid closed loop systems. Um, the best way to do it is just touch those three little lines that you see there in blue. Anything that's in blue that you, you can touch to change. And then it brings up your keypad. You can type in the amount of carbohydrate being taken. Um, and it will work out the calculation of the insulin dose. It will also give the first time you, you use, the, use the bolus calculator, it will also give you some uh, an information message um, saying at meal time and when not in auto mode, it's recommended that you enter the glucose concentration into the bolus calculator. So if you didn't have a sense of glucose because maybe you were in warm up, for example, you could do a finger stick and enter it in there and it will give a more accurate bolus. But then it works out the amount of insulin that it um, should be delivered for the amount of carbohydrate. You press next and it goes to the next screen. And at this point, you can still tap this um, 2.4 and roll it up or down if there was a reason to adjust that bolus um, that's been calculated. But most of the time, you'll simply press deliver. And it will go on to this next screen with the number of units being delivered with a countdown saying that 2.4 units delivery will start in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 seconds. It counts the seconds down and then once the insulin has been delivered, it tells you that the 2.4 units of insulin is being delivered. Um, what it does is while, until the insulin has been delivered, the cancel button stays there. So if you realise that you'd miscalculated the carbs or there was something wrong, you can at any point until the insulin has been delivered to cancel the, the rest of the bolus. And if in that situation, you would get a... Um, 
you would get a message that said 1.8, for example, of 2.4 units of insulin has been delivered. Um, you can consider splitting the bolus if you have someone that's not a reliable eater, so um, someone with loss of appetite or a, maybe a child who you're never quite sure if they're a little bit of a fussy eater, never quite sure if they're going to eat the full amount of carbs. And you can order consider, you can also consider splitting the bolus if um, you're having a large amount of carbohydrate, anything over sort of 60, 70 grams, um, that you know that if you gave the full bolus up front, especially if it's a slightly higher protein, higher fat meal, you're likely to have a dip before the the glucose has finished being absorbed, um, you can split that. And we just normally suggest if you used to split your dose um, with previous pump therapy or pen therapy um, for sort of um, higher fat, higher carb meals, then just start with the same percentage split that you used to do before. So if you used to give 70% upfront and then you used to give 30% afterwards, go with that calculation, start off with and work from there. You can use the bolus calculator to give a correction bolus, as I said. So most of the time it pulls the glucose through in grey and you don't need to do anything and you would just add your carbs. But if there was a reason that you knew that um, you hadn't had the insulin delivered for the last um, couple of hours that the system thought you had had, maybe, for example, you'd had a set problem or you'd forgot to reattach after a bath or a shower, um, then you could touch that glucose level, make it go blue and confirm it, and then it would add on an extra insulin calculation based on the glucose level itself. Um, it also um, has the ability to calibrate the glucose sensor, the Dexcom G6 sensor, exactly the same as you can with the Dexcom G6. I think the thing to say here is that Generally, you don't need to calibrate um, Dexcom sensors. They're really accurate. And um, often the meter you'll be using to calibrate it with will be less accurate than the sensor itself. Having said that, if there is a reason that you know you do need to calibrate it, you think it's misreading, either um, it's um, reading high and you didn't feel particularly high, so you did a finger stick to check, or reading low, um, and uh, you didn't feel low, you might do a finger stick to check, that kind of thing. If there's something that you kind of feel differently to what the reading is saying is the, the reason most people might check against a finger stick glucose. At that point, um, you would only calibrate when the glucose has been flat for at least sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, even a bit longer, um, because sometimes the sensor can read quite different to the finger stick glucose, especially if it's moving one direction or another quite quickly. You've just bolused, for example. So um, what you would do is if you thought it was misreading, you might um, wait till you've, you've had a steady glucose level for a while before, then do another finger stick. And if it's more than three millimoles even either, either side of um, that number, then um, we would suggest that you did calibrate the sensor. And you would do that by pressing the little blood drop here um, and the um, for entering the glucose value from your meter um, ensuring that it's a, an up-to-date meter and it's been regularly calibrated itself and then the system would deliver a bolus based on the the glucose level um, sorry the system would um, realign itself to the new glucose level sometimes if it's vastly different because the sensor is playing up it might cause um, conflict it might say no sensor glucose reading for three hours because actually the system would rather give you no reading than an than a reading that it felt was inaccurate. And in that time, you can keep entering finger prick glucose levels to the calibration blood drop sign, which will keep closed loop running in the, in the meantime. And either after the three hours, the sensor will write itself or it might fail if it was misreading and then you would need to start a new sensor and contact Dexcom to say you'd had trouble with an inaccurate sensor. Um, but so yes, that's how you calibrate, although generally we would say um, it's not necessary very often with the Dexcom G6 system. So yeah, that just goes through what we said there. If it's more than three millimoles difference when the glucose is stable, um, or what I should add is once you have calibrated a sensor, it removes the factory calibration that you set up initially with that four digit code when you inserted the sensor. And so from that point to maintain accuracy of the sensor, you should calibrate it every 12 hours until that for the for the life of the sensor um, after you first first give the calibration to maintain that accuracy. The next thing you'll see on the um, 
the uh, home screen of the app is you've got these three little lines which um, are for the app drop down menu. So if you touch these, you see this app drop down menu that gives um, a number of different um, uh, menus in there from alert, share, statistics, information about the type of pump and the type of sensor um, settings, um, add meal function, and then some other bits and pieces there. So first of all, the alerts. The alerts are exactly the same as you would find on the Dexcom G6 system. But um, one of the things we wanted to highlight is that one of the purposes of using automated insulin delivery is to help reduce burden. And so it, although it can be tempting to have lots of different alerts and alarms on, we encourage people to just have an alert and alarm on that that goes off and means you actually need to do something. If you're constantly getting alerts and alarms and you didn't need to take action, then it's probably a, a waste of um, your time and energy and having the alerts come through. So what we tend to say is put a low alert on at a level where you've still got time to help the system out if needs be by putting in some additional carbs and have a high alert on at a level where um, it might stimulate you to check um, that your cannula hasn't failed or to check for ketones, for example. Um, so other than that, you probably don't need lots of alarms and alerts on and um, it will reduce burden if you if you have, have managing diabetes, if you if you um, keep these limited as far as possible. There is a sensor signal loss alarm, which is defaulted to 20 minutes. We normally encourage people to just pop it on a bit longer. So maybe 40 minutes, 50 minutes. You know, if, if someone's just laid on their sensor transiently in the night and it's just discon it's just lost contact for a few minutes, you don't want to be woken up by that. So, but certainly if it had been off 40, 50 minutes, then maybe you would want to be doing something about that. So just extend the time of that. And there's an additional alarm that you wouldn't be familiar with with the Dexcom G6 system, which is a pump refill alarm. So if you're one of those people that forgets when they did their last refill, not sure is it today, is it tomorrow, then you can put an alarm on to remind you that you're due um, a refill. There's also the ability to set up an alert schedule. For example, you might want different alerts overnight than you do during the day. So you can have a, a play with that. And it's also worth setting the phone's widgets and banners so that the glucose level shows on the lock screen so you don't have to go into the app in, in full every time just to see your glucose level. It's also important to know the alerts can be silenced. So you can pop the alert silence on and that will um, show that you've got that on. Um, the uh, urgent low at 3.1 will override this. So even if the phone is silent, um, the urgent low uh, alarm at 3.1 will sound. The next thing in the drop down menu is the share menu. So in order to get the, di the data flowing to Diasend, um, you would go into the share menu and you would touch user one die center where it says none, you'd touch the blue none. And what would happen there is you'd get this um, uh, page comes up, which asks you for your die send username and password. So if you haven't got one, you would need to go into die send first, which is just the website is www.diasend.com. Set up a die send account with a, um, an email address and create a password as you would for anything else. Um, and then you would enter that same username and password into this page here um, to link the accounts. It's really important not if you not to tick Wi-Fi only or charging only so that the data constantly flows through. Um, the other thing that you can do is set up SMS text alerts. So this is particularly useful for um, parents with young children on the system. So they can have um, up to five followers uh, that you can so link to mum, dad, granny, granddad. Um, and once you've linked by popping in the telephone number um, and uh, the phone gets sent a verification code, which you just enter, once they're linked, you can toggle across um, on and off depending. So again, this can be really useful um, for schools and nursery, for example, if they have a, um, a, a phone that they use to keep an eye on the child, the school or nursery, they can toggle the text alerts on when they go in in the morning and toggle them off when they leave so that they get all the messages that are needed when um, the child is at school. And like I said, you can have up to five of those um, telephone followers. And there's one more thing, the clinic ID at the bottom here, which you would switch on and your clinic will have a CAM APS FX 
uh, reporting account. So um, the data, your data, as well as flowing to Diasend so that the team can, can see your data, it will also send a, a, an extra layer of reports uh, uh, to the clinic by entering a code for the clinic ID and your clinic will be able to tell you the code for their clinic ID. The next thing on the drop down menu is statistics and the phone will display statistics um, for the, the last day, the last week, the last month, the last three months. And when you're in e each of these, if it's if you're on day, you'll be able to flick back and back and back to the day before, the day before, the day before, if it's on week, the week before, the week before, month before. So every piece of data that you might possibly want and probably lots of others too um, are all displayed in the statistics page. So you can still get data off the phone um, and the pump separately, but the, this data on the phone Will, will be mostly what you'll be wanting to look at and particularly looking at things like what's happening to your estimated A1C or your GMI glucose management indicator is, is kind of an estimated HbA1c for example and what's happening to your time in target, time below target, all that data um, you'll be wanting to keep an eye on and adjust settings maybe in terms of carb ratio or target to up the time that you're finding yourself in the target range. The next thing um, below um, where there's a section on the type of pump and the type of sensors. There's lots of information that you'll see on the DANA I, which one it's linked to, and the Dexcom G6, which one it's linked to when you last inserted the sensor. But below that, you've got some set, some setting information, which takes you into another sub-menu. And there's a few things on that sub-menu. So the first thing there is to change the weight. If you've got um, someone who, so we use the system for children and for pregnant women. So if weight changes significant, significantly, it's worth popping the new weight in there. The block feature is so that small children can't bolus or give any insulin or change settings really on the app. We also suggest um, having, well, to use the bolus calculator in any case to link the app, you need to have a pin code on the phone itself. So you have to have security set up. You would obviously wouldn't want a situation where you could leave your phone lying around and someone could come along and give you an insulin bolus. So there's also an extra layer of security really for small children. So you can pop block on as well as having a pin code on the front of the phone. Personal glucose targets, the next one in the settings menu. And as I said before, um, although this defaults to a personal glucose target of 5.8, you do have the ability to set it and personalize it anywhere between 4.8 and 11. And to do that, you'd go into the personal glucose target menu, you toggle across the button to turn it on, and then it gives you this um, screen. You would press plus at the bottom here, and then it asks you what hours you want to set it for and what you want to set it on. Um, and you can see in this situation, someone has just touched that um, setting and popped it on 6.5. Um, so, and, you, and that's, they've done that for the whole 24 hour time block, but actually you can plus and add in another time block so you can have as many different targets um, as you want over the 24 hour period, although it would be rare to sort of have more than two or three really and, not, and probably unneeded. Um, one of the important to, things to say when you're starting using the system about the personal glucose target is that to start off with, as I mentioned, all the system knows about the person that's using it is their weight and their total daily dose, and it learns and optimizes over the next two to three weeks. So um, in a situation where you're using the system potentially with a sort of higher starting HbA1c or in young children who have higher glucose variability, um, or in, if someone's um, tended to, to you know, be generally running a bit higher, um, it's wise to start with a slightly higher personal glucose target than the 5.8 to mean that if the system sort of overshoots initially um, while it's learning, um, that you end up not dropping down into the hypo target. And, and especially as well, if you've gone straight onto the system from um, MDI, so you transition uh, to an insulin pump, straight from MDI and, and go on to the live onto closed loop automated insulin delivery straight away. And you might have some background basal insulin still hanging around from when you transitioned. It's wise just to set the personal glucose target a little bit higher so there's less risk of it overshooting. So certainly when we're looking to start smaller children, we might even suggest setting it as high as sort of 8.5, 9.5, just for the first few days so that you can see that the system isn't causing dips. Um, and then once you're happy, you can then nudge the personal glucose target back down um, to, where you, to where you want it for the long term. 
when you turn the um, phone on its side, you see um, lots of information here in terms of um, the insulin delivery and the um, so the, the thick blue line is the insulin delivery from the, the automated insulin delivery from the algorithm. The little dotted line there that you can see is the basal that would be running on the pump if it wasn't running auto mode. Obviously, the glucose level is in this gray statistics band. And we're aiming for that to be in this target range of 3.9 to 10 for the majority of people for as much time as possible. And um, you can adjust that band. So if you're using the system, for example, for um, uh, we use it for pregnant women, where rather than a 3.9 to 10 stats band, we, we want it on 3.5 to 7.8, which is the internationally recognized target range for pregnancy, we would just go into statistics and just adjust the high and the low stats band so that the um, all the statistics and displays are um, based on that slightly tighter target range that we need in pregnancy. Generally, though, for the rest of the population, adults, children, 3.9 to 10 is the target range, the standard recognized target range of time and range that we're aiming for. Um, and you can also just see here, just uh, um, out of interest, you can see this is how a bolus is displayed. So at this time of day, sort of about uh, quarter to nine at night, someone's had 35 grams of carbs and it's given a 5.85 unit bolus. So once you turn the phone on its side, to the landscape view, this is the kind of information that you see. This is just a reminder of the, the time and range. So this came from um, a consensus um, of opinion, uh, international group of um, uh, recognized, you know, uh, internationally renowned sort of diabetologists got together a couple of years back at one of the big clinical meetings and um, calculated where the sort of time in range, target range needed to be in order to achieve that sort of gold standard uh, target HbA1c of um, between um, 6 and 7 percent or 42 to 53 millimoles per mole. So uh, you can see for type 1 and type 2 diabetes aiming for 70 percent of the time between 3.9 and 10 with less than 5 percent of the time below 3.9 and less than 1 percent of time specifically below 3 with um, less than 25 percent of time spent over 10 and less than 5 percent of time spent over 13.9. And again, if you've got someone who's a slightly older adult or at higher risk, you'd slacken this off a little bit, not aiming quite so tight. So we'd like at least 50% of time in range. But for pregnancy, that's where these tighter targets come in. So in, we still want 70%, but the target range between 3.5 to 7.8. So it's much tighter, but still with less time below target and less time above target. As I said, when we went into the bolus calculator menu, you can see the meal size. So um, you can preset those if you want to. So generally, there's not such an um, important reason to, unless it's something that you maybe have regularly that you want to just preset. So for example, um, if you ha always have exactly the same breakfast, you might preset your small knife and fork as that exact same amount of carbs for breakfast. Or if you get a coffee on the way to the station with a certain quantity of milk, for example, you might send your snack, set your snack size, your tiny knife and fork up to just be the right carbs for that coffee. So if you have something regularly, it can be useful. Um, and if you wanted to change them, all you would do is where it's blue, you touch the relevant one, you dial up or down to the bolus size that you wanted um, and then make the changes to those settings. You'd see them there and then you just use the back arrow to go back to the settings menu. Also, the ability to change um, whether you use carbohydrate grams um, or exchanges. In the UK, we tend to use carbohydrate grams, so it's defaulted to that. But we also use the system in Europe when they tend to go more for 10 or 12 gram exchanges. And so, again, you can just switch to whichever is most appropriate for you. And then there's the last few things on the settings menu. You will remember when we talked about setting the pump up in advance and going into doctor's mode that we have um, the bolus step on 0 0.05. And we just need to pop that in here in the settings menu to um, make sure that the system is aligned with the pump itself. There's also the ability to change the speed of the bolus. So it defaults to 12 seconds per unit, which is the fastest it goes. But sometimes we'll have someone who says they're struggling with um, occlusion alarms when they bolus. Maybe they're having larger boluses and the um, insulin trying to force itself through such a small needle under the skin 
can tend to cause sort of a bit of a backup. And in that case, it's better to reduce the bolus speed and run the insulin uh, bolus slightly slower to stop that uh, occlusion alarm have happening. You've also got the restore hidden message um, icon there. So if you had been um, saying you never want to see these messages again, but actually you wanted to remember when the time when it was right to use ease off or boost or, or see some information that the system provides you with, you can restore those hidden messages and they'll all start showing again next time you go into the different parts of the home screen. Below the settings menu, there's the add meal function. So the main use of the add meal function is to tell the system if you have had to go in with additional carbs to help treat um, a low or help avoid a low. So um, the main job of the system, what it's overwhelmingly trying to do is avoid um, glucose levels dipping into uh, the hypoglycemic range. So it's constantly trying to do that um, in any case, but, the, but it, what it can't do is prevent you know, hypoglycemic episodes 100%, although they will be less used in closed loop. If you find that you've had a low alert at a level, um, say it's gone off at 4.1, you'd be looking to see what is the system doing to help um, avoid me going low. So what you'll see is if you get a low alert, you'll probably turn the phone on its side and see that the insulin uh, delivery has backed off to nothing, maybe for sort of half an hour, 45 minutes before you've even had the low alert and that the glucose level is just starting to sort of skim that low level. You'll also probably touch that little eye icon and see how much active insulin is there from a previous bolus. If you've accidentally miscounted the carbs that you've had at lunch, for example, um, the, the system can back off to nothing in terms of further insulin delivery, but it can't suck the insulin back out if you've really over bolused for lunch. So um, you might base your um, decision on how much extra carbohydrate to take on those three pieces of information, really. What the glucose level currently is and the direction of arrows, um, so the rate of fall, uh, what the um, active insulin in the system is. So you'll touch that little eye and see how much active insulin is currently there. And you'll probably turn the phone on its side and see what the algorithm has been doing for the previous sort of half an hour, 45 minutes. Has it backed off? Does it look like the glucose is going to skim? If you think it isn't and you need to take some extra carbs to just help get the glucose up or stop it dropping, then um, we would encourage you to enter those into the add meal setting on the, on the phone and tick that it was hypo treatment to confirm that. So what add meal does is it advises the algorithm for extra snacking and top up meals. So hypo treatment, like I said, or slowly absorbed meal. So you'll see there's another box of slowly absorbed um, meal function. So generally um, you'll be just maybe popping in you know, a small amount of carbs if you've needed them just to help the, the glucose level back on the, on the right track if it's been dropping. So you might pop in there, you've had four grams of carbs extra tick that it was hypo treatment. And what the system would do then is as well as logging it and sort of um, learning that you've needed extra carbohydrate at that point, it will also be careful about how much additional insulin it delivers in response to the, the rise uh, of glucose that will happen following um, the extra carbs that you've popped in. The other thing though is that you can tick is the slowly absorbed meal box. And as we said earlier on, if there's a reason to split your bolus because you find that for certain meals, it works better if you have some of the insulin up front and then the rest delivered later, um, we would initially just say, go through the phases of set your, um, have your, just try bolusing normally to start off with, seeing for a lot of people with closed loop that will work anyway. If you find you know you do need to split the bolus, split it in the same way as you would have before. So if you did 30, 70% uh, up front, 30% um, uh, later on, go with that first. Um, what you might find is you don't need to add in the 30%, the algorithm itself will just deal with it. Or it might be that actually you pop boost on after an hour and the algorithm plus boost deals nicely with that other 30 grams of carbs as it's more slowly absorbed. Once you've tried those things, though, if if they haven't happened, if they haven't kind of worked to keep your glucose in the target range or um, or it's kind of gone up or gone down more than you'd have liked um, and you need a different tactic, then there's this slowly absorbed meal function. So in the example I gave before, if you had put a bolus of 70 percent of, of your insulin had gone in up front, um, you would want to enter the other 30 grams of carbs um, or the other 30 percent of carbohydrate into this slowly absorbed meal function. So say you were having 100 grams of carbs, you'd put 
you'd bolus for 70 grams of them. This other 30 grams, you'd pop the 30 grams in here. If you touch that um, amount, um, the keypad comes up, you'd type in 30 grams and you would tick it with slowly absorbed meal. And what would happen then is the system would give the remaining percentage as um, uh, six extra small boluses of insulin over the next three to four hours in order to mop up that glucose as it comes through from the more slowly absorbed meal that you've eaten. As I said, though, when you're first starting, this is kind of um, the, the sort of last thing you'd look to try. The, initially, you just need to let the system learn about you. You need to get your um, carb ratios right. Um, and um, if you had any problem with meal boluses, you'd probably start by splitting the bolus out first. If you were still finding you weren't getting, achieving the glucose level in the target range that you wanted to see, then this would be the sort of last thing that you could try use the slowly absorbed meal function and see if that helps just keep keep you down in that target range after those certain sort of higher carb, higher fat, higher protein meals. And that's what it looks like on the diacend data. So the add meal advises the algorithm of the extra snacking on the top up meals and it would show the um, it would show the six little boluses of insulin coming through over the next three to four hours depending on what the glucose level was doing. So actually, if the glucose level was on the low side for whatever reason, it wouldn't give these extra boluses, even though you've set them to run. So it's a super safe way of, of delivering that insulin for a, um, a slightly sort of more slowly absorbed meal. One of the other things that um, is really important to note on the drop down menu is you've got the ability to stop the sensor. So um, if the sensor comes to its end of its life naturally, it just times out and it says um, you'll get those same alerts of when it's due to end and you and um, you would um, normally leave it to run its run its course and you'd get your sensor end message and then you'd replace this, the sensor and transmitter and start the new sensor. That's all fine. You just carry on as you would normally do. But if you want to stop the sensor before it's actually run out, um, for example, you know it's due to run out at three o'clock in the afternoon, but you you were going to be at work or your child's going to be at school at that time and you want to change it in the morning. Um, if you're changing it before it's died, then you would want to stop it and you'd go to the bottom of the drop down menu, stop the sensor, and then it will give you the um, the icon come up to start a new sensor once you've popped a new sensor and clicked on the transmitter. If you don't stop the sensor before you change it and it hasn't come to the end of its life, essentially the transmitter doesn't know that the sensor has been stopped. And so what it will do is it will um, it will just pick up reading again and you'll think it's strange because it hasn't asked you for the four digit code on the back of the, um, the strip that you've peeled off and it also won't have asked you to start warm up. Um, and then it will work for a few hours, it will just start reading and then it will still die when it was due to die at three o'clock in the afternoon anyway. So if you're changing it early, you do need to stop the sensor. Really, really important point to mention is that when the system is in auto mode, you will see on the pump face that it's flashing no delivery. So it comes up between two phases of 0.00, .00 at 0% and then no delivery. And what the 0.00 at 0% means is the app has switched off the normal pump basal, the preset pump basal that now all it's there for is to be the safety default. So if you lose connection, you don't have any glucose data and the system can't run in auto mode, it will flick itself back to um, usual basal insulin delivery that's preset in the pump. So it's important that the, the, the settings are pre-programmed properly before you go live with auto mode. But what it then does is flash no delivery. And sometimes people will look at that pump and panic because they think, oh gosh, it's not delivering insulin. It is delivering insulin, it's delivering insulin in auto mode, it's just not delivering the basal insulin, it switched that off. And usually, unless the pumps take, unless the algorithm's taken the decision that for this next 10 minute, 20 minute cycle, you don't need any insulin because you're on the lower side, apart from that time, it will say extended above and it will tell you how many um, units per hour the system is delivering via auto mode. If there was an actual problem with the pump, it would be flashing no delivery and the reason that there was a problem. So it might say no delivery occlusion, no delivery low reservoir, no delivery low battery, and it would be beeping and buzzing and telling you that there was a problem. 
So we talked earlier on about ease off and boost button. So just to recap what the use of them is, um, ease off is designed when you need less insulin. So it might be during periods of activity or exercise, or actually if you've just been having a bit of a problem running a little bit on the low side. So for example, maybe it's a really hot day and you're just more um, sensitive to insulin um, and you just the system has been sort of dragging you down a little bit, the insulin has been dragging you down and you just want to say to it, actually just back off a little bit here. So um, you would touch the ease off button and it would ask you, first of all, how long you want to run ease off for. So um, the same rules apply to normal pump therapy. The insulin that's going into you now will be having its most effect in about an hour's time. So if you're setting ease off for a particular activity or exercise, then ideally you want to set it to run from an hour before you're going to do that exercise. For example, if you're going for an hour's walk in an hour's time, you might want to put it on for two hours um, and then you would press next and then it would give you the option of wanting whether you want to um, start it now or later. So if you're one of those people who needs to um, wants to use ease off, for example, for an exercise class in the afternoon, but you always forget to set ease off running the hour before the exercise class is due to start. You can pre-program. You can say, I want my ease off for two hours to start later. I want it to start at one o'clock. So by the time I come to do my exercise class at two o'clock, it's already been running for the hour before and it's already um, and then it will also run and give me less um, insulin, be less aggressive in the hour of the activity. And you just choose which you want now or later. If you choose later, you set the time of when you want it to start, press confirm, and you see at the bottom it says either ease off is running, or if it was for later, it would say planned ease off and when it was running. And if for whatever reason you decided you didn't want ease off on anymore, or you didn't, you weren't going to go to your exercise class anymore and you wanted to cancel your planned ease off, you'd literally just touch that cross and confirm that you want to stop the ease off and it would stop and go back to saying ease off and boost. So there you can see that there with this one. This one's planned ease off at about uh, half past eight at night. It's been confirmed. And then at the bottom it says planned ease off and the time that it's planned for. And then if you want to touch the cross and get rid of it, you can confirm that you don't want the planned ease off on anymore and it's gone. So it's really simple to use. And what ease off does is it tells the system to be slightly less aggressive and it also doesn't give additional insulin if the glucose is below seven. Um, and it can be really useful for um, after exercise and activity as well. If you're one of those people who the effects of exercise and activity can can last way after you finish doing that um, particular activity or, or exercise, then you can have it running for a period of time after the activity as well. Who's kind of does the opposite? It's as suggested when kind of more insulin is needed. So um, particular times it can be useful is during periods of illness or stress or if you're um, normally super busy and active, but actually you're on holiday and you're much more sort of sitting around and taking it easy. Um, or maybe you've made a mistake with your um, carb counting at lunchtime and your glucose has gone quite high or you forgot to bolus completely. You could put boost on for a, for a couple of hours to just help the system bring you back down into target quicker. So um, similarly to the ease off setting, you would literally um, touch this and bring up the keypad and type in the duration that you wanted Boost to run for. So in this situation, an hour and a half. And you would say that you wanted it on now and you would press confirm and then it would tell you that the Boost is running for um, an hour and a half. If you wanted to put it on later, you could do the same thing. So we have some people, for example, who, um, who tend to sort of get that um, insulin resistant phase first thing in the morning before breakfast and they like boost to have been on sort of half an hour before they wake up so that their glucose levels are there's a bit more insulin around at that time when they know their glucose levels are a bit more resistant and they're a bit prone to rising after their breakfast so you could preset it for example to come on at sort of six o'clock in the morning for an hour prior to um, when you're going to eat and the great thing about um boost is that it's kind of like a super safe increased temporary basal because it will only boost if you're above target if you even though it might be still running if you drop back down to target and boost is still on it won't boost and then if you creep up again above target it will boost again for the duration that it's running and the same as before if you don't want your boost or your plan boost on anymore you just touch the cross confirm that you want to cancel it and it switches off and we saw um, earlier an example of the phone on the landscape um, 
screen but again this just gives you a little bit more information of all the different things that you see with it on landscape so you can see the um, blue um, uh, thick blue line is the algorithm driven insulin delivery you see the dotted line here is the insulin delivery that would have been given by the pump if it was just running its normal basal you see the glucose um, level from the sensor data which it goes to black when it's in the target range and goes to sort of white open dots when you're hovering above the target range. You see um, a black bar across the top that tells you auto modes on and when it was started. Um, so where there's no black bar, auto mode was off. Um, if you're bolusing, you see the amount of carbs and the amount of insulin at the top. So like here, you can see someone had 15 grams of carbs without an insulin bolus, then an insulin bolus went in slightly later. If you've used boost or ease off, they show boost shows as a red sort of hatched area over the top. Ease off shows as a yellow sort of hatched area over the top. Um, and I think that's everything that you can you can see on that screen. So lots of information um, that you might want to look at. And this is what I was saying. If you've got a low alert and you want to see, well, hang on a minute, do I need to do anything to help the system out here? What's happened? It has it been delivering me any insulin? You can pop the phone on its side, see what it's been doing for the period of time up until that point and help you with your decision making as whether you need to um, take some additional carbohydrate to help the glucose rise or whether if you've been running on that, you get a high alert looking to see what the system's been doing. Do you need to take any additional action to help um, get the glucose down a bit quicker, like popping beast on, for example? So um, you can see um, an example of uh, boost in action and, and ease off in action here. This is someone who went for their COVID jab. So when they were out walking um, to have their injection earlier on in the day, they just popped ease off on for half an hour. So the system was just less aggressive around the time that they were um, walking. And you can see later on, they kind of had a little spike of glucose where the, they just sort of became a bit more insulin resistant and the glucose was, was running a bit higher. So they just popped boost on for an hour or so, which just helped to get the glucose back into the target range a bit quicker. So you can see how it's displayed um, with that. One of the things that people sort of slip up with initially with closed loop therapy is um, sort of using, allowing a sort of ease off to lull them into a false sense of security if they get a low alarm. So if you have a low alarm, you might think, oh gosh, I'm worried I'm going to be low in a minute. Um, I'll pop, pop ease off on. But in this situation, if you, they'd have turned the phone on their side, they would have seen that closed loop has stopped giving insulin. This person's had a bolus of 5.7 uh, units at sort of just about nine o'clock in the morning. And actually from the point the bolus went in, the system stopped delivering insulin. It knew that the glucose was dropping at that point. So the minute the bolus went in, it stopped. You do see these individual little pulses, which sometimes confuse people. They'll say, um, I was on the low side, but the system kept giving me extra insulin. So the little, these tiny little pulses work out 0 0.02 of a unit and they just keep the line moving, keep the line patent so it doesn't get blocked. So you'll always see those even when, so there'll never be completely no insulin delivery, but this is not gonna make difference in this case to um, the actual glucose level. It's such a very tiny amount. Um, so, Using ease off at the point where actually the system has already um, backed off to nothing is not going to prevent a dip below target. So it's just worth um, just using your common sense thinking, OK, um, I've got a, a low glucose alarm. I wonder what the system has been doing. OK, it's already not given me any insulin for the last half an hour. And I still think with the arrows and the rate of fall, I'm going to I'm going to go to the lower level. I'm going to get in with some additional carbohydrate. Ease off is not going to help in that in that situation. If you had a little run of dips, though, that day so far, for whatever reason, then it still might be prudent to put ease off on for a few hours afterwards, just to sort of say to the system, actually, just back off a bit. I've been dragged down a little bit low today for whatever reason that might have been. Um, I've been more active than I was expecting, for example, and I forgot to put um, ease off on before whatever reason it might have been. But but yeah, always check the landscape view to see before popping ease off on in that situation with a low alert. Just some practical things to keep the system linked up. The um, range is about six meters. So you always need to keep the phone with the, the person wearing the transmitter and the pump. Otherwise the, the component parts will become disconnected. 
if you're taking the pump off for more than 15 minutes, it's worth suspending the insulin delivery because the closed loop mathematics is basing its calculations on insulin it thinks has physically gone into the person. So um, if you're off the system for more than 15 minutes for a swim or a bath or something, then it's better to suspend insulin delivery. And you do that on the Dana pump itself. When you do suspend insulin delivery, you will get a, a buzz or a beep from the pump every 30 minutes just to remind you, Ooh, by the way, you're, you're suspended. Are you sure you still want to be suspended so you don't end up leaving it on longer than was needed? And the other thing people struggle to find is they often look to see where they adjust their carb ratios on the app. But actually, carb ratios are adjusted on the Dana pump. So you'd go into the um, settings, uh, the bolus menu and bolus settings. And the first one that comes up when you go into there is the CIRs, CFs, carb insulin ratio correction factors. And you would change your carb ratio there on the pump. And the phone reads that carb ratio on the pump when it connects when you go into the, the bolus icon there. If you need any help day to day with sort of um, uh, issues with glycemic control or you think your settings need to be changed, your carb ratios maybe don't look quite right, then you should go to your um, diabetes team to help you with that. If, however, you have got a problem, a technical problem with the app, um, then we would encourage you to go to the CamDiab customer support, either the phone number, which is nine till five, Monday to Friday, or the support email, which is support at camdiab.com. Although the help desk is only um, manned nine till five, Monday to Friday officially, um, the emails are sort of kept an eye on out of hours. And if there is something that we can do to support someone who's having problems, then we act absolutely will do that. There are also some closed Facebook groups that you can uh, find. So there's a CAM APS FX uh, group for kids and also a CAM APS users group. So you can search those on Facebook and ask to join.